We are here. We have arrived. Yeah. Look, it's been fun, right? We just talked fantasy football all night. We're, we're, we're in hour number there. Uh, DJ Rob Swift. Yes. On the turntable tonight. Yes, yes. What do you guys think yes. for us? You're now listening to the legendary Daniel Esquire. Come on, give it up for the executioner. Y'all motherfuckers ready? DJ Rob Swift. What a fantastic show. Vinyl Esquire. So New York City, y'all. The Swift motherfucker, they call him Rob Swift. Do your thing, baby. Oh, I think I'm good now. New York, y'all motherfuckers ready? Rob Swift. Rob Swift, this right here is gonna be something. Everybody. Hello world, I want to welcome you to Vinyl Esquire, and my name is DJ Rip, and Vinyl Esquire is the DJ podcast dedicated to uplift the DJ culture and honor our legends. And without further ado, I would like to welcome to Vinyl Esquire, the legendary DJ, the legendary turntablist, one-fourth of the iconic DJ crew group and DJ conglomerate, the executioners. I would like to welcome to Vinyl Esquire, the legendary DJ Rob Swift. What up, Rip? Thank you for the honor. I'm really appreciative, man, of all the kind words you've just bestowed upon me. It means a lot, man, and all my life I've dedicated myself to earn people's respect for what I do as a DJ, so I really appreciate what you just said, man. Absolutely, man. It's the truth, and uh, I think you're an incredible DJ and deserve all the accolades, so let's give you your flowers while you're here. You know what I mean? Right on. So, Rob, can you tell me who or what made you want to be a DJ? The first person that comes to mind is my father. I grew up as a little kid in Jackson Heights, Queens, the son of immigrant parents from Colombia. And my dad migrated here in the late 1960s, uh, sent for my mom and my brother in the early 70s. And I was born here in New York City. Um, and my dad brought over his love for music. So as a kid, I have fond memories of helping him pack equipment, transport it uh, to different people's homes to halls to basement in churches sometimes he'd drive as far as new jersey to dj parties for people and i would just sit there and watch my dad control people with music and he was my first example of what a dj is and the next person that comes to mind is my older brother my brother john aka universal my brother came up with the first wave of kids that were immersing themselves into hip-hop culture. So, you know, he's from the Grandmaster Flash, who hurt Africa Bambata era of hip-hop. So okay. my brother would sit me down and play a lot of the old classic Park Jam tapes. He played me the battle between uh, Kumo D and Busy B. He would play me the battles between Cold Crush and Fantastic Five Freaks. And he would always make sure that I was paying attention to the music, what was happening. And he'd, he'd explain to me how the, the DJs like Theodore and Tony Tone and Charlie Chase and Jazzy J would be looping the drum sections of, of music that they were rhyming to, that their uh, MCs were rhyming to. And he would just explain, and explain to me the science behind what I was listening to via those t those cassette tapes and I owe my brother a lot because although my dad is my first example of what a DJ is, my brother's the one that actually explained to me the whole concept of, of being a DJ and, and the roots of hip hop and the tenets of hip hop and breaking and graffiti and all that stuff. He introduced me to the whole culture. So uh, those are my two, I would say, main foundational ex uh, influences as far as wanting to become a DJ. Got you. So what year would you say that you actually started as a DJ? I started DJing in 1984, um, like right after the movie Wild Style came out. Um, I asked my brother to teach me how to DJ, and he did. He sat me down and explained to me the whole concept of, of what it is to control people via music. I was 12 years old. Wow. So 12 years old, 1984, Rob Swift became a DJ. What was your first DJ name? My first DJ name was Robbie Rob. And I was Robbie Rob for, for a minute, I would say about a year or two. And a friend of my brother's who rhymed and would come over our home and, and make 
tapes with my brother and I'd sit there in the living room and watch them jam. Uh, sometimes I get I'd get on the turntables. Uh, his name is Javon, and Javon, I remember once pulled me aside in my parents' living room and was like, "Yo, man, you should change your name. You should call yourself Swift, DJ Swift, because you're so fast, you know, with what you do and and how you do it." So I took his advice, took on the moniker Swift, and right before I started competing in in the DMC competitions of the early '90s. I decided I, I wanted to put my my legal first name before the Swift because I just wanted people to know me on a personal level. Like, I just didn't want to be Swift. I, I wanted people to know me as Rob as well. So I put the Rob in front of the Swift, sort of uh, paying, paying homage to um, one of my favorite B-boys, Ken Swift. Yes, sir. Yes, you know, I always, sir. I, yeah, I always liked, how, um, I always liked how Ken Swift had his real name in his b-boy name so i wanted to have my real name in my dj name so i put rob before the swift and it stuck since wow that's incredible i, I i'm familiar with ken swift i'm a fan of uh, hip-hop and b-boys as well so that's incredible so so i believe that the world or uh you know on, on a big plateau learned of rob swift you know in the 90s again you know with your competitions to the dmc and then you know joining the executioners but you started in 84 so talk to me just quickly about you know uh, you know, the 80s, you know, the, the mid and the late 80s for, for Rob Swift. You know, what was it like? It was an amazing time because I was learning about what it meant to be an organic, authentic DJ. You know, I came up in an era where the technology wasn't as advanced. There was no social media. So you really had to exercise a lot of patience and grit and commitment to, to becoming a DJ. You had to be loyal to your art form, you had to be willing to exert the energy it took to build your record collection, to leave your home and, and, and buy records and just literally like go on these excursions in Brooklyn, Manhattan, the Bronx, Queens, wherever you needed to go to find that, that copy of that record that you were looking for, that you heard such and such play on the radio. There was a lot of, um, a lot of growing, man, and, and, and hard work and time and energy that was invested in those years. And the, uh, the, another interesting thing about the 80s era was, unlike today where we have social media, so you're constantly sharing what you're doing, and then it's easy for people to get a hold of a new technique. Um, you do something today brand new, and within seconds, all your followers are now up on this new thing that you did. Right. Back then, you know, you, you, it's like you had to really exercise patience. Like, you weren't going to just blow up as a DJ overnight. Like, it took years of work years of building your name years of doing house parties and and giving people tapes and and if you were lucky after after two three years your neighborhood would know who you were you know and right. whereas now after a week you know you could pay to to have followers and and you know to look like you're just the most popular dj on the planet so i appreciate that era because it really taught me patience and it taught me how to just trust the process whereas now right. people want things to happen now whereas now people want things to happen immediately i feel like back then you you just really had to exercise patience there was no choice you know absolutely what motivated you to want to be a turntablist or a trick dj and and then get into competitions what led you that way the djs that were doing it you know what i mean like i i loved studying the art form i was a, a scholar not scholar but student i should say yes of this art since i was 12 years old you know what i mean so like once i learned all that my brother had to teach me then i moved on and started studying other djs that played on the radio uh chuck chill out red alert molly mall are the three main djs that like i would sit on the weekends at home on the couch and just study what they were doing how they were playing music the kind of music they were playing the scratches they were doing what right. what differentiated each dj from the from the other person and then there would there would always come a point where i would learn all they were doing and then i was like all right well what else is there and then i started discovering um the battles uh johnny juice another big influence on me from the 80s era would play he was on a radio a college radio show and he would play live like he would record excerpts of vhs tapes um, from these battles and then air them live during his, during his show. So that's when I discovered DJs like Cutmaster Swift, Cash Money, Aladdin. And I was like, man, they're doing crazier shit than what Molly Maul and Red Alert right. and Chuck Chill out of Right, absolutely. I, I need to now, now I need to learn this. And, 
So it was like all the DJs from beginning to now that were being creative and just pushing this art form influenced me to want to be a part of that and, and be creative as well and do my part to push the art. So yeah, that's what motivated me. Those, those, legendary pioneer DJs. Got you. Did you start competing in the DMC competitions before you became an executioner? Or, you know, what what was the process? Because I, I understand you became a group member of the X-Men who later became the executioners in about 91. Is that correct? Well, so here here's the story. I met my mentor, Dr. Butcher, in 1990. I was introduced to him by Juju from the Beat Nuts. Yes. Juju and I were good friends. We grew up in the same neighborhood, and he was like a big brother to me as well. And he understood how passionate I was about DJing. And I think even he could tell that I ran out of sources to learn because I was pretty much like the best DJ in my neighborhood. But he knew of Dr. Butcher, which was a better DJ. And he lived in the next town over. I, I grew up in Jackson Heights. Dr. Butcher lived in Corona, Queens, like where Fuji Rap is from and uh, like Kid and Play right, and stuff right. like that. So yes. um, so basically, I kind of, again, ran out of sources to learn from. And Juju was like, yo, man, you got to meet this guy, Dr. Butcher. Like, you're going you're gonna to learn so much, Rob, if you link up with this guy. And I remember at the time, I thought, oh, man, like, all right, I'll meet him. But I wonder what else can I learn? Because I, I know so much already. And sure enough, when I went to his house, he just humbled me. Like the, the stuff that Dr. Butcher was doing was light years beyond anything that I had learned how to do. And I was humbled very quickly and automatically like in those martial arts movies where, you know, the young kid thinks he's the best fighter and then he's, his, his ass gets worked by some old master. <laughs> right, he, right. You know, yeah, that, that he uh, underestimated. That's basically what happened with me. Like I went to Dr. Butcher's house thinking, man, I'm going to, I'm going to show this guy how dope I am on his set. And he ended up really humbling me. And right then and there, I was like, dude, I want to learn from you. And he took me under his wing. So I, I introduced Butcher to say, Butcher trained me for my first battle in 1991, the East, the East Coast DNC competition. Right. And in that battle, the X-Men also were competing. And the, 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 at the time, the, the, the key figure, like the figurehead of the X-Men was Steve D. And Steve D had won the previous year's 1990 New Music Seminar Battle for World Supremacy. So, like, he was, like, the hottest DJ at the, at the time. And, you know, everyone respected him and looked up to him. And I entered the battle. I placed third. And in my opinion... I feel like what happened was I made an impression on Steve and the rest of the X-Men because they were, they were all also competing in the battle. And I placed third. Okay. And, and Steve D actually won the battle. And I was mad. I remember I was like really pissed off because I didn't win. I, I, wanted, I wanted to at least place second because the first and second place contestants were flown to Chicago to compete in the American finals. And that was my goal was to make it to the American finals. So like, I remember I was mad. Like I, I was given prizes and I threw the prizes into the crowd. And, oh, okay. I, and I, and I, I think, I think that that emotion that I showed made an impression on Steve D and the rest of the guys. And I remember Steve that night went up to me to console me and told me like, yo man, you're dope. You have nothing to be down about you. Here's my number. He was like, yo, I want you and Dr. Butcher. He had already knew Dr. Butcher. They had practiced together previous to that. He was like, yo, man, I want you and Dr. Butcher to come over to my house and we could practice together, man. Like, you're, you're dope. You're going to go places. And when we, I was like, I took him up on that. About a week or two later, I was at his house with Dr. Butcher. And right there, Steve, he asked us if we wanted to get down. So that's how I got down with the X-Men. We didn't become the executioners until 1997 when we signed our record contract. It was myself, Mr. Sinister, Rock Raider, and by then Total Eclipse got down with us. We signed a record contract with Asphodel Records, and the law the lawyers from the label were scared that we would get sued by Marvel Comics, so they basically forced us to change the name. So I came up with the name Executioners, and the guys liked it. So that's what we've been running with since then. So, okay, so let's back up a little bit. So give me the original members of the X-Men. The original members of the X-Men started out with four. It was Rock Raider, Sean C., Steve D., 
and Johnny Cash. Those are the four original members of the X-Men. Okay. Um, then in 1990, Eve inducted Diamond J from Long Island, who was EPMD's original DJ. Right, correct. And also Exotic E, rest in peace, Exotic E passed away earlier this year. So it was Exotic E and Diamond J that followed up the original four members. And then I was inducted in 1991 and then in 1993 we we put down Mr. Sinister and and it was it was that total ensemble and um by then it was like just me Sin and Raider kind of like we were the face of the X-Men and we were the ones that people saw out doing shows and shit like that. And in 1996, I met, uh, well, I'm sorry, in 1994, I met Total Eclipse. And a couple of years later, in 1996, we and we decided to make Total Eclipse a part of the our unit. So, But the original four members were Sean C., Rock Raider, Steve D., and Johnny Cash. Wow, okay, that that's incredible history right there. So between 91 and 97, I would assume, um, you continued to compete. Talk to me a little bit about some of those, you know, competitions and what happened prior to uh, uh, what you had mentioned before, the, that first Executioner's album in 97. Yeah, we, we battled, or I battled from 1991 to 1992. Uh, I, I dedicated two years of my life to competing. And then after I finished competing, I got tapped by Akinelli, who appears on a song called Live at the Barbecue right. by Main Source. Mm-hmm. Um, Akinelli was about to sign a record contract, and he saw me win my 1992 DMC competition here in New York and was impressed and tapped me to be his DJ. So I started touring with Akinelli, uh, did the scratches for his album Vagina Diner, and working with Lost Professor in the studio and meeting nice. Nas and artists like Busta Rhymes and Q-Tip you know, really helped me propel myself and, and move into that next level of creativity. I wasn't just coming up with battle routines. Now I'm collaborating with artists in the studio, and that was awesome. And I did that from 1992 through 1996. And then in 1996, uh, things started to take off for us. Like, we, we became recording artists, and we signed our record contract with After Bell Records. And in 1997, we released the first turntablist album by a turntablist band or a group of DJs and it was called Expressions and that was so that was so critically acclaimed that we ended up signing a record contract with Loud Records and then we released our second album Built From Scratch and we recorded a song with Lincoln Park called It's Going Down that blew up now we're on MTV and right. uh, commercial radio and we're touring the globe and you know it's just been a crazy ride man and i'm just very appreciative <laughs> right yeah right. That i've experienced all this stuff absolutely well rest in peace rock raider as well so talk to me just a little bit before we move on talk to me just a little bit about you know the experience again being the first turntablist you know group crew dj conglomerate that first album how many albums did you put out with the executioners we released three albums expressions on acid records built from scratch on Loud Records, and then we released the third album called Revolutions on Columbia. So how did you approach these albums? It's a lot of, you know, a lot of incredible DJs in one room creating these projects. How did you guys approach these albums? Well, the first album, honestly, we had no idea or clue what we were doing. We were just kind of just winging it. And for me, that is what makes that album so special. It's like we had no barriers. We had no real structure. We were just in the studio brainstorming, having fun, being creative, trying things. And the, and when you listen to the album, the fun that we had just really oozes out of that album, in my opinion. Right. Um, when we moved on to Loud Records, there was more structure. We had like an A and R, who actually coincidentally was Sean C, an original member of the X Men. He became an A and R at Loud. So well, now, that... although Sean C was an X Men, he became our A and R. So we had like this other person that was like guiding the album now. Whereas on the first album, it was just us kind of just feeling our way through the process. Now, Sean T was just kind of guiding us, telling us how certain songs should sound, reminding us that we needed to focus on uh, trying to make music that was going to be on the radio, uh, pushing us to collaborate with mainstream artists like Linkin Park, who at the time were like the biggest rock group or rap rock group. Back then, rap rock was like major. So, you know, now we had an A&R. <clears throat> so that was a different experience, like 
making music for radio and not just having fun making music. And not to say that that process wasn't fun, but it was just those. It, it, it was just different. It was a different experience. Uh, and then by the third album, now we had the pressure of living up to the the notoriety and fame that we built with the prior two albums. So right. I feel like the third album was like a different experience in that, like, I don't necessarily feel like we had as much freedom on the third album revolutions. Like it was more about, we need you to make this kind of song that you did in on the last album, because that kind of song was popular and that's why you guys are so big so we need to make another similar song like that like it was just a lot of like pre-planned a lot of strategizing and it wasn't the experience wasn't necessarily free like it wasn't right. like yeah it wasn't really um it wasn't organic like like, like before yeah it was yeah organic is, a, is the perfect word it wasn't organic it was more calculated you know and and that was a different experience because now we're like, God, all right, you know, we got to do this kind of song because we're under pressure to sell records and we don't want to get dropped from the label. So, yeah, it's just like it was just all three different experiences for sure. Absolutely. So uh, w was that ultimately, you know, the reason for the executioner's breakup or dismantling and making you go solo? Talk to me about that. Why, why was the third album the last album? What happened? I think I think it played a big role for sure. I think the the fact that we were under so much pressure to to make the perfect quote unquote album that was going to sell a million copies made it so that we were all kind of just working under pressure and not flowing. Like art is supposed to be creative, and if it if that art that you're making blows up, then great, you make a lot of money or a lot of people discover who you are and great. But but when you're making the art itself, you, you need to be connected and censored and present with the art being that we were making this album and only focus on the outcome it it, it kind of created a lot of uh dysfunction amongst the group because everyone kind of although we all wanted the same thing everyone had different ways of, of, of feeling like they we should accomplish the outcome and and having those different approaches then we started arguing and all that stuff so i wouldn't say that was the reason we broke up i would say that played a role but regardless of whom or what, it, it, everything, I guess, runs its course in life. And right. Um, right. nothing lasts forever. Life itself isn't promised. Um, you know, I could sit here and be talking to you now, and five minutes later, I could get shot in the head, or I could crash my car, or I could well, have a heart attack. Or I could yeah, yeah, let's hope none of that. Something. Let's hope none yeah, of that happens. <laughs> yeah. I guess my point is, you know, that ran its course. And and, gotcha. and then I then it was like all right now I gotta focus on my my career and I gotta figure out a way to like continue on as a solo artist so absolutely I'm glad that. I'm here, still standing and still figuring my shit out. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of your solo albums. Because, I mean, it looks like, correct me if I'm wrong, it looks like you, you had at least seven or eight solo projects that you did. Is, mm -hmm. is, is that correct? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I I personally have lost count. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I think, I think I, I'd probably say as far as projects, like consider, like including mixtapes and mix CDs and, and stuff like that, I would say over, over nine, ten projects projects I've released over the course of my career. So talk to me just a little bit about how you, you know, how you approached them. I know you have a few of them, like, you know, the, the Abe List, mm -hmm. Airwave mm -hmm. Invasion, Sound Event, Under the Influence, Who Sampled This, you know, just to name a few. You were consistent from 97 to 2013, at least, on putting out musical projects. Just talk to me quickly just a little bit about, you know, some of your solo projects and how you, you know, approach that versus the group projects you did. Well, the solo projects were a blessing for me because it gave me an outlet to exercise a lot of the ideas that I felt might not have been executioners fitting, you know, like, uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, progressive with how I approach DJ and I like to try crazy stuff. Like, um, for example, on the ableist, I worked with an actual live band and that was never done before on, on, with regards to turntable music and putting out albums. On my second album, Sound Event, I, I made a, a salsa song, but with scratches because I'm Colombian. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Okay, so dope. These are, yeah, these are things that, um, the, the song was uh, called Salsa Scratch, and it featured Bob James. Very um, nice. On piano. Yeah, so I guess the point I'm trying to make is these are things that maybe in the context of the executioners wouldn't work. 
Right. But as a solo artist, I, I was like, I'm going to try everything and then just see how, what sticks, see what people, what resonates with people. So that to me was the fun thing about working on all my solo projects is that you have a 100% freedom, 100% control to make your music and be creative the way you want. But most recently, you know, cool that we're talking about projects because this, uh, within the last couple of days, I just released my latest project with my partner and original, not one, one of the, the foundational members of the, of the executioners, my boy, Mr. S- Mr. Sinister, yes, he and I just, just released a project under the name The Odd Couple, and we're putting it out on 8-Track's label Fool's Gold. And Very nice. um, we just, yeah, man, thank you. And we just released the first single, it's called The Reappearance featuring the real DMC on the on the mic and uh, we got artists like J Live, Breeze Ever Flowing, Chubbs, Uptown Bodega. We got producers like Dr. Butcher who mentored Mr. Sinister and I. We got our friends working with us, um Aton Noise. So it's a great project and now um uh, you said like oh, I I you know I, I see that like from like nineteen ninety eight to like twenty thirteen you've been releasing stuff. In twenty thirteen I kinda started immersing myself more into de- teaching the art of DJ. Yes. Um but now I'm back recording music and putting music out and I'm I'm happy again and blessed that I have this opportunity to collaborate with with my old friend Mr. Sinister and and tour I'm excited to get back out on the road and and reach people and DJ and and continue to push this art form Absolutely. And and I'm glad you brought up the new project because I, I, I saw I saw footage of the Goldie Awards, I believe. And I seen you and Sinister performing as the odd couple. That, yes. was, that was incredible. So I want to get back to that because I want to end off the interview talking about the new project. But I want to touch on a couple more accomplishments and things that you've done before we get out of here in your career. So you've also appeared in a few films. You've been in uh, the movie Scratch. Yes. And then uh, and that was in 2001. And I believe in... Uh, Oh seven as the turntable turn documentary. You've been as yeah. uh, as the technique spin documentary. It looks like you had your own uh, project in in twenty eleven. DJ Rob Swift live. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah, and then uh, the master class with Rob Swift. So I just wanted to mention a few of your film projects that you've been in because being a DJ and a turntablist, then you became an artist. And obviously you were uh, helping produce these records with your other counterparts. And then you were a tour DJ. And then you appeared in films. So let's talk about a couple other things that I know that you've done. So you became a professor in 2014. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I uh, for a few years, I was teaching a class in DJing, an intro class and an advanced class at the new school, and uh, also touring the country, lecturing on the art of DJing at various universities and colleges. Right now, I'm actually working on a project of putting together a seven-man DJ septet off and we're going to present a piece with these seven DJs at MIT in Massachusetts uh, in January of 2020. So in a couple of months, I'll be flying out to Mass and coaching the seven septet band and performing this piece. So uh, for the last few years or so, I- I've-, I've been dedicating my life, my life's work to pushing the art form of DJing beyond the nightclub scene. I, I want people in the academic world to receive this art and, and accept it and recognize it as formal art form. You know what I mean? And that's why, yeah, and that's why I I decided to teach at at the universities and and lecture. I went to Indiana University earlier this year and did a lecture on on the art form. So I'm just, yeah, man, I'm I'm wanting to project this art form and be a, a torch carrier for it. Yeah, and so it's just time for me to just pass that torch. Absolutely. And you, and you worked at the Scratch DJ Academy for a little while as well, correct? Yes, yes. I just wanted to highlight some of these things that, that you've done because my next question is, is that, is there something that you want to do that you haven't done yet? You know, as far as the DJ culture is obviously concerned. Yeah. You know, it, it would be nice to, like, have uh, facilitate a way for, for my students to work and book them on tours and send them on a road so that they could go on and make money off this the way I have and support themselves. Okay. So that that's something that I haven't done that I would like to do in the future is be like a, some sort of like a, a, a management entity because right. a lot of people develop the skill level but mm-hmm. don't know how to turn it into a commodity. Like you could be the best scratcher in the world. You could be the best beat in the world. You could have 10 titles but still live at your mom 
mom's house. Right. You know right, what I mean? Right. Or or you could have you could you could everyone could celebrate you as being the most technical master DJ. Um, but you, you know you you in order to make money you're you're having to work at FedEx or UPS. And it's not to say that having a nine to nine to five isn't you know a good thing. That's you know that's a respectful that's a respectable thing. Like you're working. But the point that I'm trying to make beyond that is that there are a lot of people like Hubert, Mixmaster Mike, Cut Chemist, myself, that are making a living off DJing. And, and it's possible. It's hard. Absolutely. It takes a lot of work, but it is possible. So I would like to try to facilitate a way for my students to work as well. And that's something that like every now and then creeps up in my head like, man, I wonder if at some point I'll be able to maybe start my own booking agency and just book my students yeah, like or help them or management and help right. my students develop their 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 careers, their their presence, you know? So, yeah, like, yeah, like a turntableist agency. Absolutely. Right. Or yeah. a firm. Mm -hmm. And and I might even right. be able to help you move that idea along as well. And that's why I always ask these kind of questions. Um Yeah, but, right you know, on, man. Yeah, but you know, we could talk offline about that. So let's um Right on. So again, you, you know, you, you've had you've had a lot of accomplishments, uh, Rob, and and I believe that, you know, you you dedicate a lot of your life to the DJ culture as well as the scratch and turntableist culture and it, it's incredible so let's talk about the project now so you you have recently would you say reunited with mr sinister to create the odd couple is that how you would you know position it no i, I honestly i wouldn't necessarily use the word reunited only because sinister and i for the most part have always stayed in touch even when we weren't necessarily collaborating together on a creative uh landscape we always would check in on each other, call each other, yo, what's going on? How are you? I've, out of all the X-Men executioners, I've known Sinister the longest because he and I were mentored by Dr. Butcher. So gotcha. Sinister really is, is a brother to me, more than just a colleague and a friend, and someone I DJ with. He's, he's a brother to me. Like, we fight like brothers. Like, we love each other like brothers. And so we necessarily didn't, like, reunite to make this odd couple concept and then tour and and actually we are, were already doing shows um together way before we released this EP uh back in 2018 January Sinister and I just started hanging out and practicing again just for fun and we started posting videos of each other's practices from my house right. and then the video started to get popular with people um people were just like yo well, are you guys bringing this to like any of any cities like in my area like right, I'd love right. to see you guys live and Gradually, uh, I always say, man, God works in mysterious ways because from posting videos to YouTube and social media, then booking agents and people that just did parties throughout the country started DMing me and messaging me like, yo, uh, would you guys like to do a show together? And next thing you know, we're like touring. And then we weren't necessarily even trying to tour. We just wanted to practice together and just reconnect and vibe because it was like the beginning of the year which is like usually the slow period for djs and he and i just wanted to get creative um and that was the, and then fast and, and that was the beginning of this year yes that yeah and that was the beginning of 2018 okay gotcha. january of 2018 and you know about 20 21 months later uh here we are at the beginning of this year uh again we started practicing like we did the year previous to that right. and sinister I remember walked in my apartment and was like, yo, man, it's great that we're practicing, Rob. This is fun. But we got to start thinking about maybe releasing a, a project, man, because if we're going to tour more and continue this, our name and our reputation is going to get us but so many shows. We're going to need product to promote, to give people more reason to book us. And I was like, you know what? You're right. So he pretty much convinced me to, to uh, put this out, this EP together with him. So... We started working on the EP, and then um, in May, I linked up with A-Track, who owns Fool's Gold Records, and I was like, yo, man, we have this EP. I'd love for you to hear it, and if you like it, maybe you could put it out on your label. And he, I remember he, I met up with him in, in the city. He came down to my truck. We, I played him a CD, old school style. We sat in the truck and just vibed to the, to the whole project from beginning to end, and he was like, yo, this EP's dope, man. I want it on Fool's Gold, and here we are, November single just got released this weekend we're doing a bunch of promo for it nice. the, uh, the ep drops november 14th and um we're getting a lot of love from people via social media and stuff like that so 
Very I'm nice. I'm excited and thankful. Yep. Well, this interview will drop right after that, so it'll be perfect timing. So, um, yeah, that's amazing. So, salute to A-Track, another dope turntablist DJ. So, the album is coming out on Fool's Gold Records, which is A-Track's label. It's an EP. So, talk to me. So, uh, what is that? Five to seven songs. Talk to me about the production, who produced. Just talk to me about the project. Yeah, so, uh, we got the real DMT on a song called The Reappearance, and that's the first single. And basically, The Reappearance is just us kind of establishing that we're back officially. You know, we, we never left. We're still here, and, um, and we're, we're, we're still recording music. Um, we also got a song called The Ultimate Force, which is a track also featuring my boy, The Real DMT. And The Ultimate Force for me is sort of like a... Uh, a nod to that force, man, that guides us all, whether you want to call it God or the universe. It's not necessarily like uh, some Kanye West type fucking religious shit. Um, right, it's right. Just, it's just, it's just, you know, we're dope and, and, and we're the ultimate force. You know what I mean? And for me, that's kind of like a, like a nod to like just the force that I feel that has been carrying me um, all this time and not letting me fall, man. Uh, then we also got a song called um, Style Murderer, and that track, Mr. Sinister tapped his people, Aton Noise, uh, to produce the track. And and the rappers on there are Chubbs and Uptown Bodega. We also got a track with Breeze Ever Flowing, produced by Dr. Butcher, and that's a real strong track. And then lastly, we got a song also produced by Dr. Butcher called Nothing To It, featuring J Live. And the, the first two songs that I mentioned, The Reappearance and The Ultimate Force, were produced by myself and The Real DMT. So it's a solid project, man. Um, and it's five songs, all strong, and we're consistent with the, with the project from beginning to end. Hopefully people will support it. Absolutely. It sounds like an incredible project. I can't wait to hear it. So aside from sure. this particular project, what's on uh, the schedule for, for DJ Rob Swift moving forward into 2020? Just really trying to continue to promote the EP. I'm hoping that we'll tour the nation the way we have the last going on two years now. And I'm trusting that we'll make it outside of the country and into places like Europe, Australia, Asia. That would be very nice. And also preparing to do this work with MIT in January. I'm really excited about the septet, and I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, the rest will reveal itself, I guess. We'll see, man. Absolutely. Are you looking forward to a, a full length album with the odd couple or are you just going to let it, I, I, let it, let it all roll, man. However, it's going to roll. Um, right now, my main concern is just pushing this EP and making sure that people support it, you know, um, hard, man. It's hard these days, man. Like so many people release music on a daily basis, on a second to second basis. <laughs> right, and, right. um, yeah, you could get lost easily amongst all that saturation that exists. So right now I'm not really worried about an album. I just want to make sure that we push the EP to the best of our abilities and then let the rest kind of take shape from there. Absolutely. So Rob, before we get out of here, can you give me from a DJ's perspective in your eyes, can you give me one memorable story or memorable, you know, feeling that you had in, in the history of you being a DJ? Something that you'll never forget, just one story from Rob Swift's eyes. Yo, I, the, the, the story that comes to mind is being tapped by MTV to open MTV Icon, which was a show that they used to produce that was dedicated to honoring an iconic band in music. Uh, they did one on Metallica, and the specific one that comes to mind is the icon show that they did on Aerosmith. And myself, Total Eclipse, and Rock Raider got tapped by MTV to cut up Aerosmith records in front of Aerosmith. And that wow. was one of the most amazing experiences because as a kid, I grew up cutting Walk This Way like Jam Master J did. Right. With Run DMC. And um, man, how, how crazy is it to, as an adult, then cut that same record in front of Aerosmith on MTV, in front of artists like Janet Jackson and Pink and Jay Leno and Shakira. They were all there. It was amazing, man. And like, I'm pinching myself right now as I talk to you because I'm really lucky, man. Like, I don't know. It's just insane how all this great stuff has happened to me. And yeah. 
Well, well I, I just want to mention, and maybe you just didn't connect the dots that fast, but you're talking about how incredible it was to cut the Errol Smith walk this way break and record like Jam S the J did. But how incredible is it also to have a single with DMC on it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. True. I mean, sure. absolutely incredible. And, and you know, from, from the MTV television standpoint, uh, I believe you also did some with ESPN, the late night show called Unite. Yeah, man. Yeah, I have. Yeah, that was back in 2012 for a year. I was on ESPN cutting records on ESPN. It was like a sports talk radio show, and I was the music. I was the wow. DJ. It was amazing, yeah. Man. Yeah, uh, amazing, amazing. So, again, Rob, I just want to salute you. I, I believe you've had Thank you. A, you know, a great career from 1984 to, to 20. 19 and and beyond i think you know sky's the limit for dj rob swift you know what i mean thank you man for saying that i really appreciate it man yes sir so um how can our listeners continue to follow rob swift uh check me out on instagram at brolic arm b-r-o-l-i-c-a-r-m you could also check for sinister and i on the odd couple at the odd couple d-a-o-d-d-c-o-u-p-l-e you could keep up with my battle right now that I'm doing with my students. The Civil War Brolic Army Battle for World Supremacy is an online battle that I'm posting right now on my on all my social media. And it's basically pitting my students together to see who's going to be the ultimate Brolic Army student. Uh, you go to at Brolic Army on Instagram. And obviously, on, I'm, I'm up on Facebook, Rob Swift, DJ Rob Swift, YouTube, Twitter. Check for me. Constantly posting information on where i'm touring and dj tutorials and stuff like that and obviously promoting this new project with mr sinister absolutely all, man absolutely incredible and you're now listening to vinyl esquire and i want to thank once again and it was an honor for me to peel back the layers of the legendary dj rob swift thank you man hello world i want to welcome you to vinyl esquire the podcast that delivers culture, truth, music. You ready to get your party on?